good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel on China and the global energy transition. This is probably a topic not just for one morning, but for several decades. But in any case, we're going to give it a stab this morning, and hopefully you will have a few answers, but maybe also um, a lot of questions, and that's something that's perhaps very good. My name is Ling Xue Ling, and I am an executive producer at Channel News Asia in Singapore. I'm very honored to be asked to moderate this session, which has an extremely distinguished panel. But first, let me just scene set for you. I'm sure all of you know that China is the greatest producer and consumer of energy in the world. And what China decides, what the Chinese people decide, has ramifications not just for those living in China, but for all the rest of us. China at the moment already is investing incredibly in wind and solar power. In fact, they're one of the biggest investors in terms of new investments for these two renewables. But at the same time, they do have a lot of legacy things that they struggle with, and that is 60% of energy still comes from coal-fired power station. Now, the people I'm talking to today that we get to talk to are ones who have a great deal of insight into it. I'm very honored that we have the president of the State Grid Corporation of China, which is the largest utility in the world, and that is President Zhang Digang, who is joining us from China. President Zhang literally lights up the streets of China. And also joining us from China is Professor Zhu Ni. He is the Chief Manufacturing Officer of CATL. Now, for those of you who don't know who, what that is, you should be ashamed, because they are the largest producer of batteries for electric vehicles in the world. And China has more than half of all the electric vehicles in the world. So this is the person you want to pay attention to. And this is also CATL also supplies a company that all of you I'm sure know, and that is Tesla. Here in Davos with us are also our very distinguished panel of Daniel Jürgen. Daniel Jürgen is vice chairman at S&P Global, but he is also a prolific writer, extraordinarily erudite <coughs> books, but he doesn't just write and talk about it. He has been a consultant to, on energy policies for four American presidents, and he has been honored by India for his consultations with them for their energy policy as well. So this is a man who doesn't write about it. He has also, he knows, he really knows what he's talking about. Last but absolutely not least, Elizabeth Gaines. I will be very biased to say that she's my favorite. <laughs> Elizabeth Gaines is the CEO of Fortescue Metals. Now, Fortescue Metals has, is an absolute titan when it comes to iron ore mining. And they have had decades of connections with China, decades of supplying Chinese manufacturing. Now they are shifting, and they are also looking at decarbonization and green hydro and green uh, hydrogen. But I, I, I promise Elizabeth Gaines that I will not steal her thunder, and instead we will move towards talking about this panel. Now, I'm going to kick off by talking about how China is going to manage this change into renewables when so much of it is really still anchored in coal-based power stations. How is China going to achieve its climate change uh, goals uh, you know, when this happens. So President Zhang is doing this on a scale that pretty much I think none of us can compare with. In fact, what he is doing is unprecedented. So President Zhang, would you like to tell us a little bit about how do you think that it's going to, how you're going to handle all of this? Oh. Thank you, Ms. Ling. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank the World Economic Forum for providing us this opportunity, this platform, to have this exchange. So first of all, I'll talk about the basics, some basic information of the SGCC, State Grid Corporation of China. So our core operations are the construction and management of the power grid 
our coverage, our service coverage is up to 88% in China, providing electricity for more than 1.1 billion people. In 2021, the company sold 5.17 trillion kilowatt hour of electricity and the installed capacity of the company's operating area was 1,844 gigawatt, of which 272 gigawatt of wind power and 263 gigawatt of photovoltaic power generation. So as we all know, recently, the theme of China's energy and power industry has been green development and energy transition. In particular, in September 2020, President Xi Jinping made a commitment during the 75th session of UN General Assembly to say that China will have its carbon peak in by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. Recently, we have a complete top-level design and policy around energy transition. We feel that under the guidance of the government, we have made important achievement. So some numbers for you from 2015 to 2021. Non-fossil energy consumption as a share of total energy consumption rose from 20% to 16.5%. And the installed capacity of renewable energy grew to 1,030 gigawatt. So with an average annual growth rate of 13.1%. So recently, for the last two years, mostly we focus on wind power and solar power. We have a in new install capacity of more than 100 gigawatt per year. The proportion of electric energy and energy consumption increased from 21.4% to 28.2%. And the level of electrification of terminal energy consumption ranked among the top in major countries in the world. So the power grid, let's talk about the power grid. It is a platform for energy con conversion, transmission, and matching the supply and demand. So we have a responsibility in this energy transition movement. In recent years, I just want to talk briefly about our work in recent years in four different points. The first point, we are strengthening the interconnection of power grids. We want to play out the full potential of our existing installed capacity. We, yeah, we just want to use the existing capacity. Also, we're supporting distant bases, the development of distant bases. We're also facilitating the integration of new energy into the grid. In the past five years, an average annual investment of 410 billion yuan in power grid infrastructure. So as we can see, the scale of our power grid is growing exponentially. So that is my first point. Our second field of work is that we're developing advanced power transmission technology. The reverse distribution of China's energy resources and low demand requires a very wide range of resource allocation. So we need to send electricity to faraway areas. So that's why we have UHV transmission projects. So this is a very special kind of project. For now, we have 29 different UHV transmission projects with a length, total length of 39,000 kilometers so one of which um, is more than 3,000 kilometers long. So after the end of the Beijing Olympics, we also constructed a flexible transmission project near Beijing in Zhangbei. So as we can see with this project, it helps us to better optimize our power grid. So that is our second field of work. The third field of work is to improve the regulation capacity of the power system. So as Ms. Ling mentioned, we have to better regulate our, our, our energy. 
So we want to integrate new energy. And by integrating new energy, we have to know how to regulate, how to integrate the whole power mix. We believe that we have a very good storage technique for now. We have a large capacity of storage. At the same time, we're also promoting flexible retrofitting of thermal power units by approximately 100 gigawatt. And new energy storage, we're still in the development stage. We have an ambition plan of having 100 gigawatt uh, storage capacity by 2030. We're also actively tapping the user side to adjust resources so then they can, they can use all the different types of energy. So that's the third field of work. The fourth field of work is the digital transformation of the power grid. Without the digital transformation, it's difficult for us to step into the new era. We have 8,000 smart substations. They're like pure smart substations. And we have 500 million smart meters. So from households to companies to factories, they all have smart meters. And at the same time, we have more than 90% of the distribution network has been automated, which they're easily observed and easily controlled. At the same time, from the supply side, we have the world's largest new energy cloud platform. And we're providing um, our service to a lot of people. We have a one-stop full process online services for 2.67 million new energy stations and with 540 gigawatt of installed capacity. We're trying to cut our cost and make our service more efficient. For the demand side, for our user, where we have built a platform, an intelligent vehicle networking platform. We have a lot of chargers. Our number of chargers has exceeded 1.5 million. So we're the power grid operation with the highest voltage level, with the largest connection scale, and we also have the strongest resource allocation capacity. So I just mentioned four fields of work that we're, uh, we're continuing in order to start this energy transition. Thank you, Ms. Ling. Be into only electric vehicles, but I think that um, President Zhang has already raised some very, very interesting questions. So I'm going to throw this immediately out to the audience and say, how many of you are driving an electric vehicle at the moment? One, two, three, four. So I would say that probably constitutes less than 5% of the persons uh, sitting here in this room. So now I'm going to look at Professor Dunni, where CTATL produces so many of the batteries. Um, do you think that we all ought to be driving many more electric vehicles? And what would happen, though, if all of us everybody in this room converted to driving electric vehicles because suddenly we would be all plugging in to a grid that is still fueled by fossil fuels. So, Professor, what do you think? Should we all be driving electric vehicles? You're going to make a battery that is so incredible that you know, it's going to be marvelous. We'll be able to get you know, days of running out of it. Thank you, Ms. Ling, for your question. Good morning. Good morning to all the participants today. So first of all, I'll talk a little bit about CATL. CATL is a company that is engaged in energy transition. We're an innovative technology company. We're a very young company. CATL in the beginning stage, we positioned ourselves 
is to work in the field of new energy and make important contribution. CATL operations include the replacement of fossil energy, all types of uh, energy storage. So this is our position in the beginning, in the beginning of our company. And as we develop, as we see the evolution in the market, we're also evolving. So I heard that maybe only 5% or less than 10% of the audience today have EVs. But in China, because China is aiming for the dual carbon goals, we're working on the new energy transition. So from different aspects, you can see that China is develop developing very fast in a new energy field. We have a large number of cells in uh, EVs, especially in the first quarter of 2022. We also see um, very um, stellar st cells in EVs and new energy vehicles. In China today, we see that new energy vehicles has reached 20%. When we look at uh, major markets around the world, we can see that policies around new energy vehicles, we believe that, believe that by 2030 or by 2035, we'll no longer see, uh, we'll no longer see the traditional cars running on the street. So we know that the transition is happening. So concerning the question from Ms. Ling about the energy system, the energy mix around the world, we're still highly dependent on fossil energy. So CATL, apart from working from the generation side, we're developing new products. From We're also working on transmission and all alone. Uh, all on the chain. So I heard, mi I heard um, Mr. Zhang mention that China is still dependent on fossil energy, and we're we're transitioning into the new energy era. Now we're talking about hydropower, nuclear power, solar, and photovoltaic power. So these are all new energy, green energy. So these new energy, we're seeing rapid development of these energy. It will have a shock on the traditional power grid. We're talking about the security, the stability of new energy. So because of this, um, these new energy sometimes are intermittent. We have to have a large storage capacity in order to ensure the stability of energy supply. So as what Ms. Mr. Zhang mentioned, in the Chinese market, we have a, we, most of the new energy are concentrating in the western part. However, the demand is on the eastern coastal areas. So we're also discussing how to how to uh, how to send electricity from the west to the east. So, from the perspective of CATL, we're use, we're working different products, different on different products of um, EVs. We're also working on different areas, providing different products. We want to contribute to the new energy field. Thank you very much. Many of us will sometimes think that uh, you know it's perfectly possible for all of us to have electric vehicles everywhere. But I will just ask Elizabeth about her use of <coughs> electric vehicles. By the way, also one of the things is that Fortescue Metals uses a tremendous amount of energy for transportation. But do you drive an electric vehicle, Elizabeth? 
Well, I don't, Lynn. Um, I must confess to that, but mainly because in Western Australia we don't have any charging, recharging infrastructure. And if I had an electric vehicle, I'd be plugging into a, uh, a grid that's fueled by fossil fuel. So, and we've just had a change of government in Australia over the weekend, largely because of the lack of ambition on climate policy. And that's been a clear message from the, uh, the people of Australia. So hopefully we'll see more advancement and, and, and that will encourage more of us to adopt electric vehicles. But I think um, electric vehicles is one aspect of a, a, a dealing with emissions, but more broadly, and I if I look at it from a heavy transport, those hard to abate sectors, we strongly believe that green hydrogen will have a significant role to play in the future of the heavy transport sector. We've, we're investing in the, in the decarbonisation of our mining operations, and maybe just to give that some context, our scope one and two emissions, and we're the fourth largest producer of iron ore globally, are just over two million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, but our scope three emissions, and we sell over 90% of our product to China, uh, at 252 million uh, tonnes of CO2 equivalent. So we're tackling that decarbonisation, both for our iron ore operations, and we have a target to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030, but we have a very ambitious scope three target to achieve carbon neutrality by 2040. Now clearly China has a goal of 2060, but by setting a target of 2040, we're effectively saying that we see the steel industry in China decarbonising by 2040. And we're finding very strong engagement with our customers. Green hydrogen will be a vital element in that because we can, by producing green iron, we can bypass the sintering process, we can produce green steel, and we're working very closely on that technology and innovation with, with our customers in China. Uh, and the steel industry in China represents about 9% of total emissions in China. So it's a very important part of the decarbonisation of China. So whilst we obviously applaud setting a goal of 2060, we actually think there's a real opportunity to bring that forward and it could be as much as, as two decades earlier. But getting back to that heavy transport sector, um, we, we're working on green fleet technology um, and we're looking at green ammonia, green hydrogen. Obviously solar and wind will have a part to play in the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia. But if you think about the shipping industry and we ship obviously our product to China, if shipping were a country, it would be the eighth largest emitter in the world. So we have to address some of these other transport sectors that aren't going to be dealt with through batteries or, or an electrification. And we're doing that through the advancement of technology, both in green ammonia and green hydrogen, a very important part to play in that decarbonisation globally. But we know China has ambitions for green hydrogen as well. Uh, and already this year, I think, has set a target to produce between 100 and 200,000 tonnes of green hydrogen but there are ambitions to grow that significantly. Daniel, Daniel Jürgen, so what do you think? We've had a whole series of threads of thoughts now going through electric vehicles, power grids that may not actually be able to supply it, transport. You're good at unraveling lots of spaghetti ideas. Well, let me, <clears throat> let me take on some of the spaghetti. I think that um, since last October, which is when the global energy crisis really began, has brought a kind of richness and a greater complexity to thinking about energy transition. And of course, it began in Asia and then in Europe well before the uh, war in Ukraine. And I think it's reflected in the 14th five-year plan, which on the one hand sets very uh, ambitious goals to increase the annual uh, increase in uh, renewables in China by 50%. But it also says against the backdrop of energy security and uh, assuring supply. And uh, President Xi also had some comments in that in which he said uh, our energy needs must be controlled by us, which uh, points to the renewable. But I think uh, what we've seen, and it's reflected in China and elsewhere, is that the energy transition is going to be more complicated. And a question that is this, this crisis that began last October, not necessarily well perceived, but it was there, is raising the question, are we going to have a smooth transition or is there going to be a series of lurches uh, uh, of not enough investment in your conventional energy while you make your transition to, to new energy in terms of the people will think the speed will come faster. So I think there is, um, 
as uh, the 14th five-year plan said, energy security is back on the table. The amnesia about energy security has uh, been put aside. Uh, the second point that I would wanted to make goes back to um, metals. And uh, what we've been looking at is the new supply chains for net zero carbon or net zero emissions. And uh, there are a lot of challenges there when you look at the scale and the, and the size of the growth. And we are looking at, at least in a very granular way on c uh, copper, saying if you're going to achieve these goals out here, what do you need, in what's going to be the input that you're going to need for metals, and particularly copper, and when you look at it, you see uh, that there's a gap, and the question, how will that gap be closed? Will it be closed by price? Will it be closed by innovation? Will it be closed by recycling? Or will it not be closed? In other words, uh, is enough attention being given to what you need if this room, instead of being five hands going up, if a hundred hands went up, and a typical electric car uses two and a half or three times more copper than a conventional car. So I think that's a very important dimension because the notion that you can just change a $90 trillion uh, global economy uh, and it will all go smoothly, and that, but life is not really like a PowerPoint. And I think we're uh, uh, at, that, at that point, and that's what the lesson is, and just to say is what we saw over these last several months, beginning last autumn, a one-off or is it a signal that uh, we're going to have to think further about how to assure that energy transition also comes with energy security? I think that one of the very interesting things that Dan has pointed out in his books as well is about copper. Putting up, setting up a copper uh, factory takes what, do you say, 15 years? Copper mine. The copper mining, the copper, yes. Both of you. The copper mine, it says, uh, we talk about iron, but the, the International Energy Agency says 16 years. 16 years. Some other people say actually longer, and they say in some countries like the United States, it may take forever. <laughs> so these, these are always, this is definitely a marathon. This is not a sprint. If you think that it's a sprint, then you're in the wrong room. These are obviously things that are going to take a lot of thinking. Now, Davos has always been known for being non-discriminatory, so therefore we're going to take questions now from people who don't have electric vehicles. <laughs> so, does anyone want to ask our splendid panel, a uh, rare opportunity, uh, a question? And as I said, we are always fair. We will take questions from people with uh, non-electric vehicles, we don't judge you. No, are we, are we well, good? Maybe as a thought starter, just yes. on that last point mm -hmm. around the length of time to develop a copper mine. The 16 years is not the construction of a copper mine. The 16 years is the approvals pathway. So if we actually want to address this issue and we want to have the supply of materials, we actually need to have governments working with business. Business is getting on with it. There is, we're, we're drilling for copper in South America, uh, in other parts of the world, uh, because we recognise this growing demand. So we're not just focused on iron ore, we're focused on diversification in commodities as well as renewable energy. But the approvals pathway, without that government support, then it's, it's 16 years, or to Daniel's point, it could take longer or never. Um, so this is, and I agree with, with Daniel, we either have to find ways where we can have a smoother pathway to meeting this growing transition, or we're going to have a few missteps along the way because the supply won't be there. We have a question here in the front from Norway, the minister. He, he is definitely allowed to speak because all his electricity comes from hydropower. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, hydropower and some wind, but it's all it's all renewable, and uh, that's also one of the reasons why we now have, a, you know, China beats us on numbers, but we beat them on per capita numbers because, uh, <laughs> uh, which we always prefer <laughs> when we compete with China. But our um, uh, in the last quarter, almost nine out of every ten new personal car sales was all electric, not hybrid, electric, and that's for many years of a very advantageous tax policy plus very aggressive building of infrastructure, charging infrastructure. And Norwegian basically loves it and think it's a better product. It, it's cheaper to use, it's cheaper to repair, and it's a, it's a great um, a product. So if you, it, what it demonstrates is that if you, if you want to, you can transform. 
but it took many years. I mean, it, uh, it began with some very awkward vehicles for the special interested, and it took a lot of time before it really got to this level. And by the way, there's also a lot of Chinese car coming, coming in now. Uh, uh, but my point is, I, I, of course, it was easier for us because our electricity was already green because it, it only helps you partly if, if your electricity is coal. But I still think we should decouple the two because you should go for changing the use regardless of the energy source, and then you should in parallel change the energy source. So the argument is weak because yes, uh, your emissions are not going very much down on day one, but maybe on year three, uh, your energy mix has changed and on year five it's changed even further. So, so it's really important for energy transition that you think about production, distribution, and usage at the same time. And you don't let one wait for the other. And that requires a very solid public-private partnership in order to set the clear direction. And that's our experience. And the good news, it, it works. Wonderful. Um, can I put the question then, uh, in a way, to President Zhang? Because one of the things I noticed that you've spoken about previously is that uh, companies in China need to do more. And in a way, from what Elizabeth is saying, is that they're expecting, actually, uh, the steel companies to do more, and probably to do more quite quickly, by a good few decades. President Zhang, do you think that that's realistic in the sense that, is that what you're seeing when you talk to companies and about their consumption and about the changes that they're making? Based on our experience, to achieve green transformation requires a whole system. And uh, it is reflected in production of energy. At the same time, priority should be on the consumption and the other aspects. So it requires all industries and all actors, including government and the businesses, to work together. And so regarding the question, and the, we actually feel the pressure, but on the one hand, we need to ensure the security of energy supply, but at the same time, we should also look into the economical viability. So f from the perspective of China, to achieve green transformation, it's an energy revolution. So uh, China actually has promulgated a new, new energy policy. It mentioned the four types of uh, revolution. First, the revolution is on energy supply. So it means that uh, priorities will be on the development of hydrogen energy. By 2030, the installed capacity of new energy should reach the 1,200 gigawatts. So currently, we are confident about the energy security, and we are confident that the goal will be achieved. And the proportion of non-fossil energy actually reached 25% of the total energy consumption. So from the perspective of businesses, businesses, we are very confident in achieving our goal. So far, we have done a lot of work. So as a state grid, we focused on the distributed energy um, kind of feeding. And in, we focus on some land area which cannot be uh, developed and utilized, like deserts and the Gobi. So we actually have developed a lot in those areas. So and another one is the uh, another revolution is on consumption. So in China, first the principle is to uh, it's, it's energy efficiency. We need to save energy. So we need to control. We have a dual control policy focusing on intensity, energy intensity and the consumption in order to improve the energy efficiency. So that's the first one. But at the same time, we also feel that when we look at uh, wind energy, and we know that it had been converted into electricity so that the wind can be uh, better utilized. 
So as a state grid cooperation, we focus on our end users and encourage them to replace coal and fuel by using electricity so that we can achieve a low carbon uh, goal. And uh, by 2030, and we hope that uh, the uh, proportion of electricity in final energy consumption will be 36 percent. At the same time, we should also focus on the technological innovation. Well, because the energy transition requires innovation, and so innovation is the key component here. Without technological innovation, it is difficult to achieve transition. So in the following 10, uh, following 10 years, we will invest 30 uh, billion RMB. And at the same time, we also put, uh, push forward the market-oriented operation. And because we think uh, the market is very important for the regulation and allocation of resources. Just now, I mentioned that it's a whole system uh, work. So it requires international cooperation as a business. And we are very active in strengthening, uh, cooperating with our international counterparts so that we can work together to achieve energy transition. Thank you. Professor Jenny, I'll pick up on something that President Zhang was saying, and that is about efficiency and about technology. Because in the end, isn't that going to be our saving grace? In fact, that's the one thing maybe where we can, you know, we can shortcut all of these things that are, are burdening us if we can make a change, significant changes in efficiency of how we use energy, in uh, the, even our batteries, uh, all of these things. Now, that's something I know that you've spoken about very often. Do you believe that the, that technology and innovation realistically can actually make things much better very shortly? Is that directed to me? Uh, uh, to uh, Professor? Oh, well, yes, I have two no. professors over oh, here. Oh, so, <laughs> Professor, first with Professor Jin and then we'll move on to, to Dan Jurgen. Uh, yes. Thank you. Indeed, we need to achieve energy transition and uh, I fully agree with what President Zhang said, and in that it is a systematic engineering work, and we need to have an all-round kind of approach to that. So as a company, we believe that technology and innovation will play a very active role. Uh, my company, CAT, L actually uh, focuses on raw materials and uh, uh, manufacturing and uh, end user service, etc. And uh, so we actually have done a lot in new materials. For example, last year we um, actually uh, developed a kind of bi uh, sodium battery, it's kind of sodium ion battery. And at the same time, one of our workshop and also has pioneered green manufacturing. And it is the first to be recognized by the World Economic Forum. So we hope that our products uh, can be easier for the users to be to utilize, but at the same time, we also focus on the upstream and the downstream uh, sectors so that we can use uh, our advanced technology in order to reduce the uh, carbon emission. In e being a workshop, we actually have adopted the kind of uh, energy efficient uh, uh, logistics and we are also using green electricity. So our workshop in Yibing has become the first to be recognized as the zero uh, emission workshop. So 
this, uh, these are the examples to, sh to demonstrate how we can promote the green products so that our products can contribute to green uh, to energy transition. We have enough time to go into the technicals of that, but if those of you who have not been looking at the sodium batteries and the work that uh, CATL is doing, please do have a, have a look at that. It's a fascinating re reuse of old technologies in some ways. Um, Daniel, what do you think? Well, actually, what first drew me to energy as an area to study was energy efficiency because it seemed to me that it was the energy resource that was getting the least attention. And in a certain way, it continues to get the least attention because it's not very visible. There are no beautiful pictures of windmills or solar panels. It's very hard energy efficiency. It's very de diffuse. But in fact, uh, it is, in, I, not, not in the new map, but in my in the previous book, The Quest, I describe it as a fifth energy resource. And it's going to be key. And if you're looking for where the surprises will come from technology, they may come from a very disaggregated form in terms of greater energy efficiency, which will take stress off the system. Now I'm going to, unfortunately, we're already starting to run out of time, but I'm going to go to one of the topics that tends not to be attended to. We always look at supply because we have very powerful persons in this room and policy on a very large basis. But what is it that we as individuals can also do? And are we also partly to blame because of our energy uses? So as just a little illustration to all of you, how many of you in this room have sure. a phone can that I, is can over... I, can I ask... Oh, don't sorry. You, don't, maybe we shouldn't use the word blame. <laughs> I mean, that, that really makes people feel guilty. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're not Very guilty. good of our spirit, no blame. But our, do we also play a role? How many of you have a telephone that is over five years old? <gasps> Wonderful. We have three persons who have, and all the rest of us are going to feel very, very guilty. Why? Because we all changed our phones, and we're all changing all our electrical uh, uses, and I'm afraid we are increasing. That's, that's without doubt something that we cannot deny. We are all increasing our uses of electricity. So on a very fundamental level, I'd like to ask, what is it that we as consumers can do um, to make a difference? Uh, to actually take a little bit of burden out. Is it because we should just use less or should we just rely on everything becoming more efficient? So I'm going to, I'm going to push that round the entire room, but I'll start off with the most beautiful lady beside me. <laughs> um, well, look, I think from at a personal level, I think demand management will be something that may ultimately be mandated to each of us and it might be that we have to turn our heating down by two degrees over winter or we might see um, change to speed um, requirements on, on motorways and the like. So I think that there will be and there will need to be some change to consumer behaviour. But I think at a business level, uh, business is getting on with decarbonisation and we're not doing it because we're trying to tick a box from an ESG perspective. We're doing it because it's a smart thing to do. Because if, if we modelled for our business a $200 a barrel oil price or the cost of carbon offsets if we're looking to reduce emissions skyrocketing, the impact on our business is not sustainable. So that's why we're so focused on decarbonising our heavy mining business and we, we're investing significantly but we're doing it because it's a smart thing to do. Yes, it's the right thing to do as well but it's absolutely the smart thing to do and we'll make sure we've got a very robust business for decades to come. Daniel Jürgen, what are you doing to make things better? <laughs> that's a very... Writing books, talking, <laughs> doing research, <laughs> communicating. No, uh, I try. Right. Well, no, I would say trying to understand how the energy system works, so that people are realistic about what the challenges are. There are great opportunities, but they're great challenges, and you don't want to have a misstep that causes economic turmoil, yellow vests on the streets of France, and so forth. So I think. Um, taking the, the, the social dimensions together. But on the other hand, I think in terms of, you know, already a lot of people's energy consumption is regulated in terms of uh, the appliances you buy and things like that, or fuel efficiency standards, which are driving people to electric cars. But I think from a business point of view, it's a dollar and cents thing. Anybody's looking at energy prices today is saying, how do we reduce that? That's a cost. We don't need to pay that cost. How do we bring it down? Mm -hmm. So I think markets are a very important source of information about what to do. Professor Denis, what are you telling 
your people? What are you yourself doing uh, that can make a big impact uh, still on our energy consumption? So I believe that each customer, consumer should change their behavior. In CATL, we are expanding. We're having different products uh, using clean energy. We're also providing our services to uh, for rural areas so that people living in those rural areas can use clean energy as well. So what we're doing is that we're providing opportunity for people around China to use clean energy. So I also agree with what Jürgen, uh, Professor Jürgen said. Me personally, I have an EV uh, using new energy. That's what I've been doing personally. President Zhang, uh, I'm going to ask you the, the, the possibly the most uncomfortable question, and that is, what do you say to your grandchildren or children? What do you say to them? Do you say to them that China is going to still be an incredible producer and consumer? Or do you say to them, no, we're going to have to make some changes in how we consume? Um, to achieve energy transition, to use clean and new energy, this is already a consensus in China. Me being someone working in the, a power grid corporation, I feel deeply about this topic. I heard several panelists talking about what we can do in an individual level. We should change our um, consumption behavior, consumption habits, to start from, a, uh, from an individual level to help the transition to our new energy in order to have a contribution to the society. But from a corporation perspective, we're also using the power of our grid system. Being a company or being a consumption, the whole transition, all changes in our consumption habit will move toward the decarbonization, the decarbonizing model. And we're willing to work with everyone in order to accelerate the transition to clean energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank my excellent panel, and I hope that all of you will do a very green thing with me now and to give them to raise the temperature of this room, not by an electrical thing, but just by putting your hands together and clapping for this very excellent panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.